Namaste. So here we go again with another wonderful verse from Brihadaranyakopanishad. And the point of this one is there is no karma from the actions and experiences in dreams. After enjoying himself and roaming and merely seeing the results of good and evil in dreams, he stays in a state of profound sleep and comes back in the inverse order to his former condition, the dream state. He is untouched by whatever he sees in that state, for this infinite being is unattached. It is just so, Yajnavalkya. I give you a thousand cows, sir. Please instruct me further about liberation itself. So here's the first mention of Sushupti. And soon we'll go into a deeper exploration and understanding of Sushupti. But for now, notice the progression. He goes from waking into dreaming sleep, then into deep sleep, here called profound sleep, prasannatma. So this goes along with what is said in Bhagavad Gita. Yogo yuktaha prasanatma na shochati na kanchati. When one is in the state of extreme grace, he does not want anything, nor does, is he afraid of losing anything. He does not lament nor desire, in other words. So this describes deep sleep. And like I said, we're going to get into that. But for now, we want to finish out and, and round off this discussion with the idea that the self is untouched by anything that happens in a dream. He, the self-luminous being who is under consideration and who has been pointed out in the dream state, stays in a state of profound sleep, samprasada, the state of highest serenity. In the waking state, a man gets impurities due to the commingling of innumerable activities of the body and organs. He gets a little joy by discarding them in dreams, but in profound sleep he gets the highest serenity. Hence, this state is called samprasada. The self, in a state of profound sleep, will be later on described as for he is then beyond all the woes of his heart, in verse 22. And pure like water, one, and the witness, in verse 32. He stays in a state of profound sleep, having gradually attained the highest serenity. How does he attain it? After enjoying himself, just before passing into the state of profound sleep, in the dream state itself, by having a sight, etc., of his friends and relatives, and roaming, sporting in various ways, that is, experiencing the fatigue due to it, and merely seeing, not doing, good and evil, that is, their results, pleasure and pain. We have already said that good and evil cannot be directly visualized, Hence, he is not fettered by them. Only one who does good and evil is so fettered. One certainly cannot come under their binding influence by merely seeing them. Therefore, being identified with dreams, the self transcends death also, not merely its forms. Hence, death cannot be urged to be its nature. Were it so, the self would be doing things in dreams, but it does not. If activity be the nature of the self, it will never attain liberation. But it is not, for it is absent in dreams. Hence, the self can get rid of death in the form of good and evil. This came up in the explanation of the last verse as well. We didn't go into it far then, but I'd like to look into it more now because it's a big deal. 
The self in dreams experiences the result of karma created in previous lives. That's why in dreams, sometimes we enjoy and sometimes we suffer. Sometimes good things happen, sometimes bad things. This is because the dream itself is a way of burning up or expiation or experiencing the results of the karma created in the past. So then what happens? Although he experiences so many things, and he apparently goes here and there and does so many things in the dream, that is not the action of the self. That is only the mind and intelligence experiencing this karma coming from a previous life. It is not action. It is reaction. Thus, no new karma is created during sleep or during dreams, especially, even though there appears to be action. But it's not really action because if you observe yourself in dreams during lucid dreaming or by remembering the dreams later, you are not a doer. Things happen to you, even if it is apparently your dream body doing them. It just happens. You have no force of will in a dream. In waking consciousness, we have the illusion of intention <laughs> and will. We have the illusion that we're the actor, the agent, that we're the doer. And because of that illusion and because of being attached to that illusion, the actions we perform in waking consciousness create karma. And that karma is experienced in following lifetimes. So, in the same way, the karma coming from previous lifetimes is experienced not only during waking state, but also in dreams. So, in the waking state, we can have the illusion of being the doer, but not in dreams. In dreams, stuff happens. But we don't do anything. We don't take any decisions. We don't make any determinations. We don't form intentions. And we don't act. Therefore, there is no karma created while in the dreaming state. It is experienced only. The other point is that when one enters into deep sleep, sushupti, one experiences the profound peace of being in touch with Brahman, the self. Although one is still in a conditioned state in deep sleep due to the ignorance involved. In other words, even though there are all kinds of mental and physical objects around, one does not perceive them. Only in dreams, one perceives mental objects, but not physical. In deep sleep, there's no perception at all. There is no sense objects and no senses at all. In dreams, we have the mental equivalent or the remembrance or the impressions of the senses without the senses themselves. That's why no karma is created, because the senses in Jagra consciousness are the ones that create the karma. So the karma that we experience in dreams is only passive experience. And in deep sleep, there's no experience at all. But we can remember, uh, like this morning, I got up after eight hours of satisfying sleep, didn't even wake up once in the night. And I thought to myself, wow, that was a good night's sleep. Huh? And of course, I can remember some dreams from last night, but I can't remember anything about deep sleep. I know that I had satisfying deep sleep because I felt good in the morning. I remember, ah, I slept peacefully. I slept deeply. And this is joy. Why? There is no suffering in that state. 
That always reminds me of the sutra where Sariputta is lecturing about Nibbana. And he mentions that in Nibbana, nothing is felt. But he also says it's very blissful. And one of the monks questioned him. How can you say it's blissful if nothing is felt? And Sariputta says, well, it's blissful because nothing is felt. Because every perception, every sense impression is actually painful. It's a disturbance. There's another sutra about emptiness where the Buddha says that, let's uh, fast forward from the beginning. He says, when one is in a state of meditation and observing the activities of the mind, then he withdraws from that state into a higher state, a state where the mind is empty and he perceives this emptiness because of the non-existence of the mind in that state. So he's talking about the equivalent of Svapna and Sushupti consciousness. In Svapna, we see the mind. We see the impressions. We see those impressions which uh, occur due to karmic causes from previous lives. But when we go into deep sleep, we don't see those anymore. So Sariputta and Buddha call these disturbances. Why are they disturbances? Because they interrupt the peace, shanti. Huh? Really, shanti is a code word for enlightenment. Shanti is that peace that passeth all understanding, as it says in the Bible. It means that there's no disturbance. Nothing is happening. There's no activity. There's no objects. Nothing going on. And nothing there to see. This is peace. Without it, we go mad. And the proof is that sleep researchers have shown by experiments where the subject's sleep is interrupted when they go into either dream state or deep sleep. Either way, they go mad within a couple of weeks. They go crazy. They lose it. They start hallucinating. Huh? They go nuts. <laughs> we need deep sleep to reset all of the impressions in the mind. And if we cannot get that reset every single night, a sufficient reset to refresh the mind and the senses, then we feel like, oh, I didn't sleep well. Oh, I was disturbed. My sleep was disturbed. Uh, maybe uh, if you have some illness or some pain in the body, it wakes you up at night, it disturbs you. Or if you have to get up to go to the bathroom, and if you have to uh, awake frequently, then you don't go into deep sleep. You stay in dream sleep. And that's not enough to refresh us. We say, oh, I didn't sleep well. My sleep was disturbed. Means we did not get enough deep sleep to remember, ah, oh, I slept peacefully. I feel very refreshed. See, these are the things. <laughs> People say, well, what is there to know about sleep? Uh, they think, wrongly, that sleep is unconsciousness. Because they have been told this nonsense by psychology and school and, you know, society in general. But no. They think the real consciousness is jagra, and the other states are sleep or unconscious but they're not unconscious at all. They're perfectly conscious. It's just that in sleep, in dreams, only mental impressions are perceived. And in deep sleep, no impressions at all. 
So this is how we understand sleep. Sleep is a multi-layered experience of different types of consciousness. When we understand it this way, it becomes possible then to view sleep and dreams as a higher state of consciousness, not lower. See, Jagrat consciousness is always limited by the body and senses. It's always proscribed by the activities of other people, the qualities of the environment, and so on. Those restrictions are not present in dreams. That's why crazy things can happen in dreams. One scene can just melt into another seamlessly, and yet they're completely different experiences that could never happen in waking consciousness. Also, the visions, the creative visions that we get during dreams, whether it's dreaming during sleep or daydreaming, when we're imagining, you know, what could be, what we want to do, or uh, what we would like or what uh, we would enjoy to do, are not subject to the limitations of waking consciousness. We are completely free to imagine anything. I know as an artist, <laughs> <laughs> I frequently get ideas for music that I am technically unable to realize because I don't have the technique. I can't remember what I pre-hear in my mental ear. Uh, I can't analyze it sufficiently to turn it into actual music on an instrument. So this is due to the limitations of waking consciousness. Maybe I didn't get enough ear training in school. Uh, four years every morning at eight o'clock. Yeah, I got enough ear training. <laughs> well, some people can develop their hearing so that they can understand even very subtle and complex nuances in the dreams or the imaginations of the creations they would like to make. And these are, of course, your great composers, your great artists, uh, the great creative minds that can bring these deep visions into Jagrat reality. Huh? So actually, it's possible to create things in dreams that cannot be realized in waking consciousness. That means we have more intelligence, we have more scope of mental activity in the dream state than we do in the waking state. And that translates into a higher intelligence, higher state of consciousness in dreams. Objection. <laughs> Objection, Your Honor. But is not activity its nature in the waking state? Reply, no, that is due to its limiting adjuncts, the intellect, etc. This has been proved on the ground of apparent activity from the text, it thinks as it were, and shakes as it were, in verse 7. Therefore, since the self wholly transcends the forms of death in dreams, death can never be urged to be natural to it nor is liberation an impossibility. Roaming in that state, that is, experiencing the resulting fatigue, and afterwards experiencing the state of profound sleep, he comes back in the inverse order of that by which he went, that is, retracing his steps to his former condition, that is, the dream state. It was out of this that he passed into the state of profound sleep, and now he returns to it. So here's the opportunity to discuss transcendence of death. The forms of death are desire, activity, and ignorance. You know, in the wheel of Paticca Samuppada that you see in Buddhist temples, right in the center of the wheel are these three little kind of uh, yin-yang type things, except instead of two of them, there are three of them. These are the three forms of death. We have desire, both 
positive desire and negative desire. I want this, I don't want that. Then we have activity, doing, which of course creates karma. And finally, we have ignorance or delusion. And the delusion is I can have an existence as a separate individual and enjoy the material world. It's a sad state of illusion. Because in the material world, one is subject to karma, one is subject to all kinds of ontological constraints by the environment, by one's family and friends, the society, laws, and, and so many things restrict our activities. So even if we want to do something, we may not be able to do it. Maybe we don't have the strength or we don't have the money or we don't have the position in society that enables us to do that. There's so many constraints. And then, of course, karma. Because of karma, everything we do has an equal and opposite reaction. So you cannot enjoy forever. It's not possible because it's going to invoke its opposite. That's duality, isn't it? For every urge and every activity we have that targets enjoyment, it simply creates a karma <laughs> of suffering. One has to take another body. One has to go through all kinds of things that one does not desire and so on. Well, you know, it, you know, it happens to you. It happens to me. It happens to everybody. We're forced into situations that we didn't choose. We're dropped, you know, into this material world in circumstances that we don't want, that we don't like, and so on and so forth. Forced to do things, forced to act according to others' values, according to others' rules, and so on. And yet, we're held responsible for how we respond to them. This is the human existential condition, and it sucks. It's suffering. So to get out of suffering, one must identify not with the body and mind, but with the self, because the self is transcendental to all this. Why? Because the self is not the doer. And it's much easier to experience the fact that the self is not the doer in dreams, because in dreams, the sense of being forced to act or simply just going along with the flow is very much increased over the illusion that we have in waking consciousness that we are doers. See, this is part of death. Why do we have to die? Why is the body impermanent? Because in this life, we accumulate so much karma that after a normal human life of 100 years, depending on <laughs> how bad or how good our actions are, I mean, we have enough karma. You know, the people who like start wars and things like that have so much karma. My God, it takes hundreds and thousands of lives to expiate that karma. I feel very sorry for those idiots because they're making all kinds of choices and taking all kinds of actions that hurt people and taking responsibility for them. I did it. This is my power. Huh? By the power vested in me by the great nation of such and such, I declare war on so and so. They don't realize what they're getting into. If, you know, if we realized really what karma is, we wouldn't do anything. We would just sit in a corner <laughs> silently. Huh? That reminds me of the story of Jada Bharat. Jada Bharat was formerly Emperor Bharat, after which the country of India, whose real name is Bharata, 
is named. And he was such a great emperor, but at the end of his life, he retired and went to the forest and just was performing meditation, preparing for a higher birth in the next life. But he became attached to a deer, a fawn, that was abandoned by its mother when she died. And he took care of this fawn and brought him up. And then one day the fawn, you know, being an animal, just walked off and disappeared. But Bharata had become attached. So he went searching for the fawn. In the process, he fell, and that ended his life in that body. Then in the next life, he was born as a deer because of his attachment. And he was Jatishmaran. He could remember his previous life. And so he simply performed uh, great penances and austerities and got rid of that body as soon as possible. But then in his next life, he was born in a Brahmana family. And from the beginning, he was very cautious. He was saying, uh-oh, look what trouble I got into simply by getting attached to a deer. So I'm going to be very careful, very cautious not to get attached to anything or anyone in this life and just simply meditate. So he was silent. He didn't speak. He acted like a dumb idiot. He wouldn't do anything. He wouldn't work. He wouldn't do. So they said, oh, he's he's Jada. He's a deaf mute. And they simply put him out in the field to watch the cows. <laughs> so he could meditate quite freely. But then a great king came through that area, King Rahugana. And in those days, kings were carried on palanquins by, you know, six to eight to ten or even more men. So this one palanquin bearer was sick and he needed a replacement. And so they said, oh, yeah, yeah, take Jada Bharat. He's strong. He can carry the palanquin. No problem. But because he was self-realized, he wasn't willing even to step on an ant. And so by, you know, moving this way and that, trying to avoid stepping on bugs, he disturbed the king in his palanquin. And the king said, no, stop. Who is this rascal? Why is he misbehaving? He's supposed to carry it smoothly. What's wrong? And so he started abusing Jada Bharat. And Jada Bharat began teaching him Dharma. He said, just as we do not want to be disturbed or harmed in this life, similarly, every creature that has life is also conscious and feels pain. Therefore, I am unwilling to take the life even of an ant unnecessarily. And Rahugana was like, whoa, <laughs> this guy's intelligent. And he began to ask him many questions about spiritual life. And so Jadabharat taught him and then was brought into the king's palace, into his cabinet as a spiritual advisor. <laughs> But see, that is the value of remaining unattached. And it is something that we should all cultivate if we want to attain the highest enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.